Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Uh, my name is Brian Brown, and on the behalf of my colleagues here at Sanford Graduate School of Education, I'd like to welcome you to our spring uh, lecture series for the program on race, inequality, language, and education. Uh, today's discussion will explore this issue of identity. There's something really powerful about who we believe ourselves to be, and it comes from an internal reflection. It also comes from how people cue us or send us signals about who we are. So the scholars today are gonna to provide us a depth of insight of how this happens and how this matters, and particularly how this impacts uh, math education broadly. They've written an incredible text that we want to make sure you're aware of, and we look forward to learning a lot from these scholars today. In order to uh, offer the proper introduction, I'm going to introduce the moderator uh, today. And that moderator is one of my favorite colleagues here at Sanford GSC, Dr. Jenny Langer Osuna. Jenny Langer Osuna is an uh, a prof uh, associate professor of math education at Stanford's Graduate School of Education. Her research examines how young people develop identity as learners in collaborative mathematics classrooms, focusing particularly on the social construct of authority. So how authority influences how students develop identity. An incredible scholar, an incredible speaker and teacher. And so we look forward to learning from you today. So Dr. Langro Sooner, the floor is yours. We look forward to learning from you today. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Brian, for the warm introduction. And I also wanna thank uh, Coco for uh, the incredible work in, in helping to organize and, and coordinate this panel. And thank you all for um, joining us today. So for, for today, um, I'm gonna just start with a, a short story about how this monograph came to be. And then each of our panelists, um, they're authors of the, the, the chapters in the monograph. They're gonna offer some just brief remarks on the ideas in each of the chapters and commentaries in the monograph. And then we're gonna open up uh, to a discussion among the panelists and finally um, end with a Q and A um, with, with all of you. Uh, there's a lot of rich ideas in the monograph. Uh, so today we're just gonna give you a brief taste because we don't have much time um, and then invite you to read uh, further. So I'm gonna share my screen. Okay. Okay, great. Um, so this work began actually in the spring of 2017 uh, when Neryl Shaw uh, and I, and, and Neryl um, has joined us, he'll be speaking in a bit. Uh, we co-hosted a small uh, working conference uh, funded by the Spencer Foundation and held at Michigan State University called Advancing Methods for the Study of Social Identities in Mathematics. And for several years prior to this conference, we had been engaged in these long and ongoing conversations about how to understand and carefully advance uh, research on identity in, in, in mathematics education, specifically with respect to issues of methodology. And so through um, generous funding by a Spencer conference grant, we convened um, 27 colleagues across ranks of seniority, both within and outside of mathematics education, spanning a, a range of methodologies and, and theoretical perspectives, which led to a really lively and generative um, few days of, of cross-pollination of ideas. And that's where the initial ideas of the monograph chapters kind of germinated uh, during the conference and author teams coalesced. Um, we then gathered for a second meeting here at Stanford uh, to continue the, the productive dialogue and create space and community to begin writing. Um, and in that meeting and in other opportunities uh, like an ARA symposium in, in 2019, we collectively considered, you know, what does it mean to engage in identity research in mathematics education? And from our initial focus on methodology, we actually arrived at a broader project uh, focused on the ways the field produces knowledge about student identities from the initial framing of problems um, all the way to, to the publication and how knowledge production implicates power and acts uh, to afford children being understood in particular ways and, and not others. So uh, ultimately in the monograph, uh, we situated these conversations historically, starting with what we considered to be the foundational works of the scholars, uh, Naila Nasir, Joe Bowler, and Danny Martin. Um, and in, in relation, and, and these three scholars then ultimately offered closing commentaries uh, to the monograph, reflecting on the origins of the field and its future, 
um, from their perspective. And Nirl um, at the end is gonna represent those, those commentaries. So with that, um, oh, and, and I also wanted to thank uh, Robert Berry who offered a forward uh, to the monograph. So with that um, brief context in mind, I'm going to hand the floor uh, to Imani Goffney who's going to um, offer some remarks on the chapter, Bossy, Boy, and Urban, Troubling Coded Language in Mathematics Education Research. Thanks, thanks, Jenny. Um, I'm so happy to be here with you today um, to share a little bit about our work. Um, and it's important to kind of name for from the beginning that you can see from the list of authors, that this was very much um, a collaborative effort. Um, and the things that we were actually working on um, benefited from having so many different um, lenses for that. And so the big idea for, for, our, um, for this chapter is the idea that um, language is one of our most powerful communication tools, right? And so the essential part of our chapter is that as scholars, we need to be really mindful and purposeful about the language we use, right? Um, and so we pulled out some of these terms that we thought might be problematic, right? And we defined coded language as language that doesn't typically invoke social markers, right? Um, but on the surface, but it like does harm by contributing to kind of silencing and making um, identities um, invisible in particular um, in kind of deficit ways, right? And so um, what we ask people to do is to actually think about the terms and the meaning behind them and, that, um, and the power of using certain terms to frame certain people. Um, and one of the um, biggest kind of um, things that we hope people take away from it is the idea that across our scholarship, um, these sets of ideas are applicable. And um, in particular, we name two spaces. One is when you are analyzing data and thinking about social interactions um, situated in um, learning settings, so like math classrooms, um, that can pose analytical challenges for empirical researchers that actually wanna do this well, right? It happens all the time with people that are not necessarily mindful. And so they end up just using language that they've heard before, or they use terms that they think are just commonly used like bossy or boy or urban and um, without really thinking or being very mindful of it. Um, and, it's, and when scholars don't, they're actually contributing to the harm instead of actually being a part of the rehumanizing and more justice um, centered work that we're trying to do. And then also um, being very purposeful and mindful across the manuscript um, um, production process. That this is one of the things that not only as scholars that we wanna be mindful of in what we do, but that we also wanna hold each other accountable. So when we're reviewing things for journals or conferences or um, for funding, that we want to actually be mindful and hold each other accountable for the language that they're doing and the power that's behind um, the use of certain terms and language and the implications that has for the identities of the people that um, have been historically already marginalized and that we really want to kind of um, work to reorient towards justice and equity. Thank you, Imani. Um, so next we're gonna hear from Emma Gargretzi on the chapter, Institution Identities in the Neoliberal Era, Challenging Differential Opportunities for Mathematics Learning. It is an incredible honor to be here with all of you today, so thank you. I am sharing work today conducted with Ilana Horn, Rosa Chavez, and Sangwan Byun. Our work demonstrates how policies and neoliberal logics operate together to provide institution identities that can become consequential in children's mathematical identities and learning. So we're using this term um, defined by G as institution identities as the social positions within an institution that are made available by institutional authorities and that become consequential in the lives of those within that institution because they are acted upon. So consider language we might hear in schools such as at risk or off track or algebra ready 
These are categories that don't just label children, but that have institutional consequences for their placement and access to educational opportunities. Neoliberalism here describes a policy ideology that centers individual autonomy and a reliance on the free market, but combines it with active government intervention. So even though neoliberalism on the one hand suggests a scaling back of public services, instead relying on individual autonomy and the free market, it does so through interventions that demand accountability. We examined cases from four research studies, each study located in a distinct region of the United States, including both rural and urban contexts, and each case having a different narrator, the one a teacher, an instructional coach, a parent, and two students. And all four cases came from schools or districts predominantly enrolled by children of color, spaces which are disproportionately targeted by neoliberal interventions and accountability policies, and that serve communities for whom sort of school-based sorting practices have consistently provided inferior educational opportunities. This is particularly true in mathematics where ability grouping and tracking remain ubiquitous. So through this intertextual analysis, we were tracing policy language um, in the stories told by and about children. And we were able to theorize this three-part process illuminating sort of how policies and neoliberal logics operate together to provide institution identities that become consequential in children's mathematical lives. We see these components functioning together kind of like a tornado or a cyclone, right? Spiraling and pulling in educational actors and conversations. Here we see intervention and this obfuscation of learning goals and then a normalization of institution identity or position. So I'm gonna sort of walk us through that with the case of um, Paula, a black mother from Georgia and her young son, Justin, who was evaluated for early intervention in pre-K. He was pulled out of class and he came to sort of wonder what that was meant, what that really meant about himself. What was that supposed to mean about him? So this, these are words from um, an interview with Paula. The reason why I thought that the school had to interview him was he actually had an early intervention plan or I thought maybe because he was having like a learning disability, that's the reason why. So I didn't, I didn't understand why they do that but they explained it to me. Every child that starts off like three and four years old, they try to see if they have any problems you know, with learning. They said they start everyone off like that. And I didn't know why, because he's never had a learning disability. And we had a lot of meetings and they said he's a very bright student, but they still had this like over his head. And he would ask me, mom, why would they, you know, why would they take me out of the classroom? So that kind of stuck in his head, you know, and I felt so bad. It's just that by law, that's what they're required to do. So we see this intervention, right? In this case, it was based on a policy called child find. Um, the language is to identify, locate, and evaluate all children birth through 21 in the system who are suspected of having a learning disabilities, which may result in the need for special education and related services. So even though um, Georgia's formal pyramid of interventions did not begin until kindergarten because Paula's son was in a public pre-kindergarten, he was subjected to this intervention. And any underlying learning goals, right, associated with this policy became obfuscated or displaced as the focus became shifted to the management of the policy, right? It's just by law, that's what they're required to do. Pull him out, test him, evaluate him, label him. And then these categories and institutionalized positions became normalized into the everyday common sense, right? This is just how it is, this is normal. They start everyone off like that. Because of these assumptions of liberal freedom, those now inhabiting the categories are assumed personally responsible for their position within that category. So kids like Justin come to believe that the reason for being pulled out of class, for example, has to do with a personal failure rather than compliance to this accountability policy. Um, so implications for ongoing work that we point to is really that policy itself is a productive if somewhat non-traditional site for research on mathematical identities shifting the lens and the locus of change as well from the individual or even the classroom to an institutional one is a really important move for justice-oriented and mathematics education research. Thank you, Emma. Uh, so let's go now to um, Maxine McKinney de Royston to hear some ideas uh, from the chapter, Reimagining Identities Toward Political Clarity. 
Good afternoon, everyone. I'm presenting this paper or this chapter on behalf of my esteemed colleagues, Tesha Sengupta Irving and Missy Cosby. And our chapter explores existing research to illustrate the sociopolitical dispositions and stances necessary for researchers to meaningfully engage in mathematics identities research. This chapter is informed by our experiences as researchers and teachers, as former students, and really as parents raising children whose futures are simultaneously constrained, unconstrained, imagined, and unimaginable. And as racially minoritized cisgender heterosexual women who are raising black and biracial children in our middle-class homes, we embodied nuanced and even contradictory relationships to mathematics in schools. In our chapter, we draw upon Martin's definition of mathematical identity as the dispositions and deeply held beliefs that individuals develop about their ability to participate and perform effectively in mathematical contexts and to use mathematics to change the conditions of our lives. These beliefs are shaped by the social identities, be they race, gender, class, sexuality, and otherwise, and structures that are imbued with meaning in daily life and across historical time. So math identities are a part of a constellation of identities that are more or less visible and relevant across context and inactivity. In this chapter, we were drawn to really think about discursive and embodied views of a mathematical identity for the emphasis on fluidity, relationality, context, structure, and historicity. We believe these really repudiate categorical and fixed descriptions of identity. Such views also create opportunities for us as researchers to explore and surface the complex life of mathematics in society and in children's lives. So essentially our main argument in this chapter is that researchers must recognize that their scholarship is political work operating within a legacy of mathematics and racism, that there's no such thing as neutral scholarship, and that all scholarship is political. Instead, the question becomes, what politics are we enacting and advancing through our work? Centering research as political work makes clear that racially minoritized youth ma mathematical identities are number one, often flattened and distorted into inert objects portable across time, space, and context. When research primarily done in schools or school-like spaces makes claims about racially minoritized children's identities, they're subject to the anti-Black and assimilationist logics that historically shaped schooling. The knowledge produced about their identities then become constrained by institutional discourses that have historically defined racially minoritized learners as the inferior other. These discourses continue on the kinds of harms that some of our speakers are speaking about earlier. And these discourses also offer a very narrow view of who these children are and could be. And this narrowing is not arbitrary. Mathematics, the norms and values associated with it are often steeped in whiteness and dominant masculinity and are used as a rubrics for assessing all others. As such, what the field has found when it uses these kinds of discourses is prone to dangerous misinterpretations or partial renderings that get misrepresented as truth or all that is there to know about racially minoritized learners' math identities. We must then consider how knowledge produced about who racially minoritized children are as math learners in schools is likely to obfuscate or hide their excellence and be indifferent different to what brings them joy incites their desire or it brings them respect and digni dignity in being mathematical. Secondly, we assert that knowledge generated about racially minoritized children's mathematical identities must have subject world relations built into them. Identity research cannot parse learner from identity, um, learner from learner identity, from thing to, to thing to learn, or from where or when learning happens. Rather, identity research necessarily asserts who children seem to be in a place and time, and thus requires an eye to the larger sociopolitical formations and structures that shape what might be possible for them at that place and time. Building subject or relations into math identity research requires methodological approaches that interrelate micro-level views of talk and interaction with meso-level policies and practices that govern math education with macro-level ideologies of success and failure that structure schools and society. society. Finally, we take as axiomatic that complex personhoods of racially minoritized youth and understand that these childhoods and their mathematical activities, practices and identities are varied. And that they're actually unknowable in advance of meeting these children. And they're never fully knowable, no matter what context you observe them in. So ultimately what we're calling for is identity research that engages the complex role of mathematics in children's lives, that recognizes how often mathematics operates in contradictory ways as both project of subjugation and heartbreak, 
but also possibly one of liberation, desire, and joy. Understanding identity research in this way is she's analyses or understandings of racially minoritized youth that use a narrow fraction of their experiences to unilaterally define or categorize them. Likewise, research that overlooks notions of respect, dignity, and joy, and desire makes mathematics identity research anemic. A more robust and rigorous approach that one that we argue for would appreciate that math identities like any other human experience are fluid, relational, multidimensional, and context bound. So we end our chapter with an offering to fellow researchers to recognize that political clarity must permeate all aspects of the research process in order for our work to offer a foothold into the culturally, politically, and ideologically bound organization of learning and identity in and beyond schools. When we see our research as political and pedagogical, we begin to ask what research on racially minoritized children's mathematical identities aims to teach us and what we as researchers aim to learn. Asking these questions from the standpoint of growing political clarity requires accepting that the answers offer no respite from pernicious white supremacist ideologies. Instead, our use of political clarity reflects an involving assemblage of ethical and political commitments to intervene in systems of power through how we engage in our research at every stop, every step of our work. Thanks. Thanks, Maxine. Um, so we're going to come back now to Emma, uh, who also uh, co-authored the chapter um, "Ethics and uh, Ethics and Identity Research in the Field of Mathematics Education: Reflections." Mathematics education research has tended to omit its historical grounding in coloniality, reliance on coded language and settled stories, and its embodiment of whiteness as property. We, with um, myself, with Sandra Crespo, Beth Herbal Eisenman, and Victoria Hand, um, identified through our work a general agreement among scholars working at the intersection of decolonization and mathematical identity research that it is impossible and irresponsible to research identity without considering and revealing the ethical implications of this history and of this present moment. So we collected um, interview-based reflections from 10 at the time early career scholars, amazing individuals um, listed here who take humanizing or decolonizing approaches to their work eight from mathematics education research and two from education um, disciplines more broadly. We asked them about the connections that they saw between ethics and identity research, the general state of the field, how they approach ethical work themselves, possible pushback, and what people are hopeful about. Uh, while we did systematically identify themes across the interviews, and you can see those on the right here, we chose in our writing to really center multivocality, to center the text around the direct quotations from the interviewees themselves. So in that spirit, I'm gonna share a few of these quotations. You're gonna hear recordings um, of the quotes being read by others, not by the original speakers, since they were anonymized um, in the direct quotations. And I invite you to pay attention, attention to your own interpretations, your own questions and assumptions, um, given your own positionality in this moment. Um, I will attempt to post each, each quote in the chat as well. I think one of the most important things for me is we have developed over a long period of time who a mathematician is or who like this sort of profile of what it means to have a math identity or a productive math identity or a positive math identity. And when researchers take this up, it, that's, it's sort of unethical in my mind to begin with that profile. I don't know if, it, if beginning with the end is the right phrase, but basically we walk into the research having done a literature review using theoretical frameworks or whatever, and, and sort of feel like we understand based off literature what math identity is and what it looks like to a certain extent. So that's a really important connection for me, how to deconstruct the longstanding conceptualization of what a math identity is and what it looks like. I, I think that we have constructed it through white logics and white imaginaries. I've been thinking a bit about the notion of refusal and that no matter how much you might want to research something or know something, 
that maybe sometimes it's not appropriate to share. And sometimes it's okay for communities to say no, which is again, from my colonial perspective, something I might struggle with because I really want to know this. But at the same time, just honoring that piece that, especially when you're working with vulnerable communities or people who have been historically marginalized or traumatized by research, just to know that sometimes things don't get shared. I think about how to honor the way that people position themselves and telling their stories in authentic ways. The relationship is so intertwined. You can't do identity work without some ethical work. I worry about how to do research in meaningful ways that are not exploitative. And how can we represent the fact that real life is messy? Hear their stories as opposed to fix them. That's a struggle. What are the stories that we are unpacking? Are we reifying stereotypes? Are these stories exploiting the communities that we work with or are they making things better? We have to question that. I feel we are at a powerful moment when we consider the work of graduate students and junior scholars who are building on scholars before them while profoundly pushing the boundaries of the political dimensions of learning and truth. When I talk with these new scholars who will shape the field, there's an immense amount of energy that stems from a commitment to address the inadequacies and in how we've demarcated disciplines in the past. We conclude the, the chapter by recognizing the need for continued dialogue across the field around what we each consider to be ethical research and ethical identity research. No doubt this process will require constant interrogation of dominant ideologies while creating openings, pauses, and spaces for the perspectives and desires of people and communities whose lives are most deeply implicated by the categorizing and sorting practices of mathematics education. It will also require immense humility and love. Thank you, Emma. Uh, so we're going to um, finally close with Neryl Shaw, my co-editor of this monograph, um, who's gonna offer an overview of the closing commentaries uh, by our foundational scholars. All right. Hi, everybody. Um, good to be with you. My name is Neeral Shah. I'm an associate professor in learning sciences and human development at the University of Washington here in Seattle. Um, before we talk about the commentaries, I just want to say that, you know, Jenny and I started this project, oh gosh, our first conversations, I feel like were maybe five, six years ago. Um, and so to watch it to come to fruition with so many great people, it's not easy work that some of you I, I know already do this kind of work to bring a lot of scholars together. So we're extremely proud of everyone's contribution and how things did come together. Um, I think the other thing is, I think amazing to see is just, you know, what Jenny talked about earlier in, in her intro, which is each chapter in the monograph, and you heard it, is tackling sort of different dimensions of, of questions of, you know, within the realm of identity research, right? So down to data analysis, to how we review uh, manuscripts, and it's part of the, Journal publication process to the questions of policy and how they interface with mathematics identities and issues of the political and ethical you know dimensions of research. So we're covering a lot of just fascinating ground with the monograph. It was great to be part of it. So when Jenny and I invited Naila Nasir, Danny Martin, uh, and Joe Bowler to write commentaries for the monograph, we asked them to do two things to identify pressing issues for the future of identity research in mathematics education, but also to look back at how this field of work began. So in part, when you read the commentaries, uh, they function as crucial genealogies of how this field was built. On that point, it's worth highlighting uh, something that Nasir points out in her commentary, uh, that fields aren't built by one or a few individuals. Uh, as, as she puts it, there's a, a social life with the development of ideas. And she also points out how it's not coincidental that these scholars were situated uh, in the Bay Area. I think it's a good reminder to reject uh, hero narratives, right? That while we recognize the importance of truly foundational scholars and scholarship, that fields are always built through collective energy. You can go to the next slide. So I'd like to point out a couple of themes that cut across all three commentaries, then I'll briefly elevate one provocation that they each pose. Uh, so looking back at the, the origins of this literature, uh, one theme 
uh, is that it's rooted in concerns for equity in, in mathematics education. So Bowler's focus was on ability narratives and tracking, specifically how different learning environments and pedagogical arrangements afford and constrain different kinds of identities for students. Martin and Nasir's uh, focus was on Black children in particular. Uh, they sought to, set, uh, sought to counter the anti-Black deficit ways that dominant research positioned Black communities in and beyond math education. Uh, theirs was a methodological intervention on the level of epistemology, phenomenology, and at the level of meta-narrative about Black learners. For Martin, part of the contribution was to docu document Black success in mathematics rather than only failure. For Nasir, part of the contribution was to shift the research setting itself from typically anti-Black formal spaces to the everyday places where Black life was already flourishing, like in the games of dominoes and, and on, the, on the basketball court. Next slide. You can go back one. Another theme is how methods and conceptual frameworks from anthropology provided an impetus for these new inquiries to take hold in math education. So Nasir and Bowler were both influenced by Jean Lay's work on situated cognition. For Bowler, this informed her collaboration with Jim Greeno and their subsequent uptake of Holland and colleagues' important framework of figured worlds. Nasir joined other learning scientists in applying Vygotsky and sociocultural theory which provided the rationale to document Black mathematical brilliance outside the school setting. Uh, Martin's early work was influenced by John Agbu and others in ways that informed his formulation of what he called mathematics socialization and his introduction of the construct of mathematics identity. Uh, reading them tell their histories of this academic lineage uh, reminded me that one of the strengths, I think, in educational research has always been how we continue to draw from other disciplines to bolster inquiry into problems of education. And, and actually, if you read the monograph, you see that across uh, all of the chapters in the monograph. You can go to the next slide. So to close, I just wanna highlight one idea or question put forth in each of the commentaries that has provoked my own thinking since I first read them. Next slide. In her commentary, Nasir writes, it is an important and pressing task to focus on conceptualizing and measuring the aspects of learning our data suggest are critical. In its absence, we continue to reject standardized tests as appropriate measures of learning, but with nothing to replace them. I think in spotlighting assessment, Nasir pushes identity research to go beyond critique into design work to intervene at one of the most consequential points in the education system, which is assessment. Uh, it's something that one of my mentors, Alan Schoenfeld, has always said, uh, what you test is what you get. Next slide. Bowler's commentary, which is co-authored with Tanya Lamar, also urges the field to engage more deeply with practitioners and communities. They write, to us, one of the most critical directions that our field needs to consider is the translation of research into practices and information that can be used by teachers and families. So even beyond the accessibility of research to the public, I think what's important there is the possibility of deep partnership with parents and families. Next slide. In his commentary, Martin offers several provocations for the field, but I'm just gonna focus on one. Uh, one question he asks is, is a positive mathematics identity, which is often the destination for much of the existing research, enough to counterbalance white supremacy, anti-blackness and state disregard for black life? With this question, Martin is reconsidering his own early calls for educators to center positive mathematics identities. He does this by citing multiple examples of simultaneously wanton and concerted state violence against Black lives, both in and beyond mathematics education. In doing so, Martin raises the stakes for identity research, suggesting that it's not enough to counter deficit frames with frames of Black brilliance, but that identity research should also generate broader well being in Black communities amidst this fundamentally anti Black dominant culture. You can go to the last slide. 
So what I've done here is a gloss. Uh, the commentaries are exceptionally rich. I think you'll get a lot out of reading them. Uh, personally, I'll just say that uh, these scholars have been important influences, mentors, and collaborators at different points in my career. So I also just want to take this time to recognize and appreciate them and their ongoing work. Thank you. Thank you, Meryl. Um, and thank you all for offering uh, a taste of the ideas in this monograph. Um, if these ideas sound interesting and compelling, we invite you to read the chapters and the commentaries in full. Um, we're going to move now to opening uh, a conversation among the panelists, um, starting with the question, what do you think are the promises and the challenges of doing identity research within or perhaps also outside of mathematics education research? And um, to moderate, I'll ask the, the panelists to just um, like Zoom raise their hand and I'll, I'll, I'll moderate this session. Imani, you can start us off. Thank you. Sure, I can just start. Um, I think that one of the challenges that I see um, is that whenever you're writing a proposal for to try to get funding from somewhere or you're trying to write a manuscript that's, that you want to go in somewhere, um, there's always this part about how you're going to, the way I talk about it with my doc students is that like you're standing on the shoulders of somebody else, right? You're, you're um, leveraging what you've learned from other people. And so um, a lot of the work, there are lots of parts of deep histories of research that's been done that is really problematic and really harmful. And I think that one of the things that, um, um, one of the challenges, right, is trying to um, find ways of pushing forward um, that aren't necessarily connected to those really problematic legacies, right? And, um, you know, realizing that you have to kind of, you know, like, we just have to cut those strings. And like, even if it means that it's not anchored in some kind of deep kind of um, um, connections to lots of things that came before, that one of the things that we have to do is be willing to um, um, push forward with orientations for um, um, in ways that are much more humanizing and much more like, we're not gonna be able to create a framework that's going to actually, um, um, promote justice if it's going to stand on the shoulders and legacies of, of like racism, but like that's, there's going to be a ceiling to the impact of that. And so we have to figure out where to cut it. And so I think that we have to um, kind of continue to be brave and push forward in the things in creating new knowledge that's not necessarily connected to all of the old knowledge. Yeah, thank you, Amani. And, and you know, you you raised such an important point around like the limitations of building on the existing scholarship, which is how scholarship works, right? There's a there's a field in conversation, it's got a history, and new scholarship comes in and, and starts, you know, begins where 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 the where the conversation left off and, and continues building on it. Um I, I wonder with with uh the other panelists, you know, in thinking about um Imani's point, like where where to begin? Do you, how, how you know? And I'm, it makes me think a bit, actually, Maxine, around your 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 the, the papers uh, focus on political clarity. Um, what what do you think about about the role of political clarity in disrupting some of the limitations from that history? Yeah, thank you. That's where I was going to go too. Um, so just to back up and say, I think part of it is is that when we're considering the idea of political clarity, what we're doing is we're disrupting the notion about how we engage in research and what matters to engage in a research. We're like, we're disrupting this idea of objectivity. We're disrupting this idea of neutrality. We're disrupting this idea that we're somehow not a part of the very research that we do. And instead we're saying we're necessarily a part of it. And what are kind of our assumptions, our biases and our own ideologies? And how do we make those explicit? as a part of the work in order to move things forward. Um, and so I, I agree with you, Imani, that it really requires us to, to look back 
and disrupt and rethink things, even while we're still building on some important things, right? So there's that tension there of trying to use existing tools and honor the hard work that people have done, right? But then still surface the tensions and challenge issues that um, perhaps were not visible to us before or were glossed over for whatever political reasons they were glossed over. And so I think what political clarity um, is trying to push us to do is to make those kinds of political and ethic, ethical commitments clear from the beginning. Um, and then to think about how in each step of our research process from research design to our questions, to the ways in which we think are about analyses, putting that at the fore, um, as opposed to um, our political and ethical commitments being hidden. And then the life that our research lives beyond us, taking on kind of new, new kind of lives that we, that we don't control. Because they always do take on lives that we don't control. But I think by having political clarity, we can at least be clear about where our intentions are, be clear about what we're trying to teach and learn, and then, and then move from that place. I was also gonna add, I think a huge challenge right now for doing, uh, doing identity research is that, you know, we sometimes don't also make clear our own theories of learning and the relationship between learning and identity. And I think we actually have really limited views on what learning is and what identity is. Um, and that shows in our mathematics education uh, research. And it shows in how we frame the identities of mathematical, of, uh, the mathematical identities of children, particularly racially minoritized children, right? So we see this way in which our narrow views of teaching and learning and our narrow views about what's possible for children and our narrow views about what's particularly possible for racially, racially minoritized children kind of become confounded in our research in ways that actually don't allow us to see the very things that I think we're trying to see. Yeah, I, I, I uh, that's, thank you. That's make really great points in it. And it makes me think about, you know, when you said these hidden political commitments um, in the in the work, it, it takes me to both the um, institution identities chapter and the coded language chapter, where there are these uh, taken for granted um, institutions, right, these taken for granted ways of working through the system. And, you know, let alone the taken for granted use of language to um, try to describe communities, you know, I'm thinking about like in, in published papers where there's just ways we talk about uh, communities and ways we talk about children that kind of mark, this is what I'm talking about, you know, fellow colleagues, but it's filled with coded language within it. Um, and I, I, I wonder, um, you know, how, how I guess I, I want to go to the institution identities uh, chapter in particular, because you in that chapter, you guys make up this point about um, those being sites of research. And uh, I wonder, Emma, if you could you could say more about how putting the spotlight on institutions and systems as a site for identity work might kind of help in, in this conversation around disrupting uh, the taken for granted uh, political commitments and, and sort of histories of this work. Yeah, um, I, got, I got sort of really heated the other day because somebody was, I was asked sort of a new thing for me about to, to provide some recommendations on how to think about identity work in a more applied context, right? Someone wants to write a big grant and, and really support the mathematical identities of um, Black and Latinx children. I'm like, okay, great. And the sites of intervention are the children, their teachers, and their families. And I, I just wanted to, you know, cry inside and um, because I'm like, there, there's nothing wrong with the children. There's nothing wrong with our children. And we have to look to, to wait, like why, why, why do we have a problem in feeling, in, in people feeling that they are mathematical in classroom spaces? And Latin, Black and Latinx children in particular is, is not about the children. It's about what has been offered and what has been denied and how that is playing out on all of these different levels. So when I, you know, I think 
thinking about um, the, pro the provocation insights from Danny Martin um, and Naila Nasir in particular, going to spaces where something really dignity affirming is happening. Um, and I have been really drawn to that um, and pursued that in my own work. Think about what is so dignity affirming that is happening here. And what I see over and over again is these like liberatory dignity affirming classroom practices come into contact with the test, the grade that must be entered in the grade book on the online grade system that doesn't support entering any type of grade other than a percentage based grade. So a standards based grading system no like looks like you have a 40 when you're actually approaching mastery and you just you have these liberatory moments coming in contact with just the um, the supremacy of the institutional demands to accountability and to sorting mechanisms. So when I think about um, shifting the lens to policy, I've started to think more and more, I think policy can feel very far away, federal policy, it's really big, but a lot of policy is happening in our school districts at the school board level, in spaces that are actually being highly influenced by a small number of people. Um, and thinking about what's going on there and how that's shaping what's happening in our schools, I think could be a really important site to explore that intersection a bit more, more carefully. I just, I know we wanna to get to the audience Q and A, but I just wanted to say two quick things on, on things that have been brought up. Um, so one is on this point about revision, which I think I'm glad we're talking about that. I think that's really important. Also just to just second what Maxine said about theories of learning and, and having those be explicit in the work. I think that's, that's absolutely correct. Um, uh, I want to also start though by talking about something that Maxine raised about the stories that we tell. Uh, it's not just an identity research, but because we're talking about that here, we'll focus on identity research. But I think that's one thing that I think you know that Danny uh, Martin in his commentary really highlights. I couldn't get deep into it, but I think, like for like he poses you know really explicit sort of thought experiments and scenarios about if how are you gonna how are you gonna tell a story about you know black identity formation in a math classroom without situating it in relation to, you know, state-sponsored violence against black people, right? So like we've all seen the videos of black children in math classrooms being thrown across the room. Erica Bullock's written about this, right? I mean, so he, he talks about that in the commentary and I think he does it in really powerful ways. And so I think that is a question about how the research gets written up. There's analytical methodological questions in there. And I think there's a lot for our field to to truly think about, even beyond math education, anyone doing identity research across fields. This point about revision, I also think is really important. Um, so there was a, a really nice conversation a, a couple of months ago on the Ezra, Ezra Klein podcast between Tressie McMillan Cotton um, and Kiesi Lehman, uh, who wrote uh, the memoir Heavy, which you might've read. But they have an explicit conversation about revision because Lehman recently, uh, per he purchased the rights to books that he'd written in the past, right? Before Heavy kind of hit it big and then people knew him. And he did that because he wanted to rewrite some of the original text for all kinds of different reasons. But in that conversation, they talk about revision partially as specifically as, as a black practice, like black heritage practice. And he's interesting ways of thinking about that. But I think even more broadly, this idea that as academics, our thinking evolves and we should have mechanisms like particular academic practices to go back and have ways to revise things we've written rather than have those be ossified in time. I think that's a provocative direction to think about revision. Thank so, you. Can I, I'm, I'm sorry, I just wanted to build on one thing that, that, that yeah, um, yeah. was also said. Um, one of the things that we were asked to kind of think about is, um, especially for some of the grad students and kind of very early um, beginning scholars. And I think that um, I'm, I'm thinking about the scenario that Emma just raised about being invited to kind of collaborate on research. And um, I think that one of the things to do is to like, we all have different strategies that we use for approaching this. Um, but like to start like 
figuring out what your strategy is to think about how you will push back in question, right? So I really like the power of asking good questions. So like when that kind of came up, you know, I, you know, when they're saying, oh, we want to do this when we don't have this intervention and we want to look at these things and we're like, hey, could we maybe pick something different as the as the problem space, maybe we could pick, you know, the structures of the schools instead of necessarily thinking that the kids are the thing that needs to be fixed. Can we design around that? But I think that the figuring out how you want to kind of um, find ways to say things or ask people things that invite them to think about it in a fundamentally different way um, than has been done before um, can be a way um, into having starting to have different conversations to design the research. I'm on a research project and we like we've designed designed an app and we're trying to figure out the forward facing thing. And I named, I said, okay, well, teachers might want numbers, but the reason that people want numbers is because it makes it easier to sort. So if we give them numbers, then we're giving them permission to use it in that way. And that is the opposite of what we said we were doing as a design. So now what do we do? But like holding ourselves accountable for that, right? Holding ourselves accountable. Like we know the kind of structures they're using and what they will do with them regardless of what we say. So part of this is also in the design part and like pushing those things forward and asking people to think of different orientations so that you're not the only one kind of critiquing things, but like asking good questions can also prompt people in different ways. Thank you, Imani. So um, I, I've been I've been paying attention to the the Q and A's um, uh, chat, and there's some really thoughtful questions on there. We've got a, a few minutes to to um, address them, and uh, I want to start with um, a, one question that uh, you know I kind of started to to answer in the in the chat, and and there's been a little bit of conversation around it, and I think it directly builds to to what we've been talking about so far, where the, the, the original question was, you know, is there like a website where uh, a reader or, or, or an author um, can submit their article and it kind of analyzes whether there's sort of bias and sort of coded language? And I started to think, well, you know, there might be like that's so contextual and that's so potentially kind of like quite, quite subtle that, you know, could AI really do that? And it sort of led to conver- this. There's a bit of conversation in that chat. But I think the broader question is if you are uh an an author sort of trying to be thoughtful about this um so much of it is 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 so kind of taken for granted and and ubiquitous how does one reflect on their work and notice how the the possibility of coded language in their in their manuscript what are some ways that as uh researchers do you think we could begin to um engage in that reflection uh, in, in our own work Yeah, I can just quickly make a point about this because of um, from the coded language chapter. But I think that part of the educational work for individuals, I think, is reading um, historical analyses of racial ideologies. Right. So I'll give you a I'll give you a concrete example. Right. So like, how would you know that the word boy, when it's applied to to black men, is is a pejorative? Like, how would you know that? Right. It's that's not new. Right. So there's there's all kinds of historical analyses of that kind of language. Right, and so in I know uh, Ibram Kendi's uh, first book, Stand from the Beginning, he actually there's a lot of actually you know pretty trenchant discourse analysis of racial racial ideolo- ideologies like that, and so I think part of the education work is to read those kinds of historical discourse analyses to to help you understand how how kind of modern language use is actually connected, a hundred, two hundred, three hundred years in the past. Right, so that's that's one way to do it. I was going to say something very similar to to Neuro, which is to read, you know, and and in in reading and reading outside of our field, right? Reading outside of mathematics, education research, reading outside of education research helps you understand how other people play with words and define things and helps you recalibrate your own language to be more precise towards your meaning and the different meanings that could be taken up from the words that you're using. I also feel like you know, here's where it gets, I think, really difficult of like being vulnerable to others about your in-process thinking and writing and getting feedback. You know, one thing I really like to do is to ask people to read things and to say, 
what do you understand from this, but also how does it make you feel? Because sometimes I think we read into people's work what we think they intend, as opposed to be really clear about how what we're reading makes us feel and where we got those feelings from and pushing people to, to then sort of project back onto their work what they want people to feel when they read their work. And I mean, I think this, this speaks back to the process of revision that we were talking about earlier. Um, I feel like one thing that we, we um, do really well, the farther we get on into the process of being scholars is, is open ourselves up to the processes of revision and realize, realizing that everything can be revised. I don't know that we do so that, that so well in our training um, of graduate students. I feel like we often set up a situation where people have to feel like they have to make a mark in the sand and say something important, as opposed to be open to always revising and always thinking of things as in process. And I feel like when you talk to older scholars, they're just like throwing out all kinds of stuff and everybody's like, everything's up for debate. And you know, the, I think newer we are as scholars, the more tightly we hold on to things because we need a foothold and we feel like we need to establish ourselves. Um, and the question I think I always ask of myself is when do like footholds become restrictions um, and don't allow us to actually represent the things that we likely are thinking. Um, and so that's why I think I always try to focus on feelings because especially if we're, we're earlier in our scholarly voice and understanding, you still have feelings and those feelings matter. And it's really thinking about how do things make you feel and then thinking, how do I make that clear to other people through the language that I, that I can use? Yeah, I think, yeah, I just wanted to add two quick things onto what Maxine was just saying. Um, one thing that I think that um, when we're thinking about revising, like the language is important, but I think it's important to like, think that like lots of different things are up for grabs, including methodological approaches, right? Like those, as a graduate student, you kind of learn that like, this is fixed. Like this is what quantitative is and this is what qualitative is. And it has to be only the, these things. And so like, based on all, some of the other papers, you can think like, who made those rules? And who was served by setting those rules into play? And who's empowered when we use those kinds of rules, right? And is that consistent with what you want? Or actually, are you trying to do um, um, different kind of work? And so I, I think that like, um, it's not narrow the things that you could think about, like what, where you could kind of reimagine things. Um, and I think that one other point is um, when you're, when, when we ask for feedback, like I think an important part is to kind of like not be defensive. Like I was trying to tell a group of people why they couldn't use monkeys in this activity they wanted to do focusing on black students. And they wanted to say, oh no, it could kind of be okay. And it's like, yeah. So now I'm gonna have to tell you the whole truth and your feelings probably gonna be hurt because I do have the gift of words and I try to use it for good, but it works both ways. But like, you don't want to like defend those kinds of things. So like being open to receiving that kind of advice and feedback from others too is important. Thank you, Imani. And uh, we, we need to end, but I want to just um, let the, the audience know there's other really thoughtful questions in the Q&A that some have been answered by different panelists along the way. So you can uh, check those out. And um, yeah, thank you all. I just want to thank the panel members on the behalf of my colleagues here at Sanford's Graduate School of Education and the Program for Race and Equality, Language and Education. We hope this is a, the first of many discussions around the power of studying identity as a lens, the possibilities that it gives for young people to find themselves in academic spaces, to find connections between those spaces and who they are as people. So we're not constantly asking our young people to move away from your culture, your gender and identity to participate in schools. We want to empower our young people. We want to invite you to join us uh, for our next session, April 13th, with Dr. Khadidra Martin. She's a professor in our program for writing and rhetoric, and she'll be talking about race, culture, and rhetoric. So we, we invite you to join us. As, as always, we hope to see you all again. Let's continue this discussion on, on Twitter using the RAL2022 hashtag, and we hope you get a chance to read 
uh, this important text. So thank you very much. And we look forward to seeing you all again. Have a great day.